Hi, I'm Peter Merrill, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising. Greetings, and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I am your host, Jay Hersko. With me, I have fellow board member Andy Cleff. Hey, Jay. Hey, Andy. And the irregular regular himself, Mr. Jonathan Schneider. John, how are you? Doing well. Can't wait. Irreg- irregular regular, huh? Prince of help. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, he survived the uh, business value conversation that went completely sideways and off the rails. As far as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, John gets quite a few mulligans. So the topic of tonight's episode or this episode, depending upon your listening, we are going to do a quasi book report discussion around Frederick Leloux's Reinventing Organizations. So this is a book. Um, if you haven't seen it, it gets passed around the agile coaching ranks at infinitum. Uh, everybody references it. Uh, there's a big website for it. I know Lulu has a bunch of videos out there. There's actually copies of the book, I believe for PDF are available for free. Now, Andy and I have both read it. John hasn't. However, we, I did a presentation, which I'm going to link in the show notes to a bunch of people at my current job, uh, as a quasi book report readout. So we're going to discuss that. We're going to discuss some of the contents, uh, concepts contained therein. And then we're going to talk through the meat of it where this whole idea of evolutionary teal organizations, how do we get there? So uh, if you haven't read the book, if you have read the book, you might enjoy the conversation. If you haven't read the book, you might find this pretty interesting. I'm going to warn you, warn you Jay and listeners, um, I'm in an oppositional mood. And hopefully they'll show up in the functional oppositional way rather than the dysfunctional. But um, – you know, when you lay something out, I'm going to take the opposing view. Fair enough. Fair enough. Hey, let's, it's better let's see where it goes. <laughs> let's see where it goes. So yeah, um, nice. <laughs> we'll start with the early on in the book. One of the first things Alou starts talking about is the concept of a hierarchy. Um, command and control, pyramids, organizations, typical enterprise structure where it's uh, spilled out in levels. And he explains the two different types of hierarchies. The first hierarchy he goes into is a dominator hierarchy. So think about this as your dictators. This is your autocrats. Um, this may be President Trump, depending upon how angry you are today. This is your command and control organizational structure, which in any enterprise, this is the thing that we as coaches typically despise the most. The next type of hierarchy is an actualization hierarchy. And Andy Cleft, this will hit notes for you. You actually did interview someone talking about things like deliberately developmental organizations. That's mm-hmm. what an activation hierarchy is. It's building a, a quasi hierarchy, not as tight as your typical um, pyramid, but it's a hierarchy inside of the organization that really leads to development, both personally and of the company itself. Yeah. So, so remind me the colors with each of those. So because, that's, that we're going to get to next because um, uh, I think that's uh, two notes in. We're going to come back to that. But wait, wait, I have to be oppositional. <laughs> Do it now, Jay. No, just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but he does, he does make the call, which I think we could probably debate, where actualization hierarchies flourish when dominator hierarchies are removed. So let's put that in the context. And John, I'll start with you. Put that in the context of Places you have worked doesn't necessarily need to be your current role, but places you've worked. Um, would you agree or disagree that an actualization type leadership type hierarchy, it can or cannot flourish even in the presence of a heavy dominator? Is it possible? Or, and is it realistic? It, it's, it's definitely complicated to answer that because I think the audience and others have mounted a lot of the success stories and articles and journeys you would read are usually very well um, uh, respected when it is a, a very loose hand, uh, hands off leadership style and their servant leaders in the bottom of growing up and people want to hear that because obviously there's a much larger crowd that attracts to because it's the leadership crowd is a smaller executive basis. But if you look at these very large complex organizations that do have a lot of people that, you know, there's a lot of thousands of people, there's turnover, there's change in people, and there's a lot of faces where if you have a steady leadership base, sometimes that actually does uh, lend itself to the hierarchy structure of top down to drive that culture still, where where it kind of sets the precedence while everything else is kind of ebb and flow at the bottom. So I mean, you want it to be bottom up, but sometimes in all practicality, it's just, 
too complex, too many people, and you do need that leadership stance that anchors it. What do you think, Andy? You need leadership stance that's an anchor. You also need leadership at every, la uh, at every layer in the organization, even down to the smallest atomic element of the team, right? And, it, and it's not a hierarchical position. You're not the boss, the manager. It is a momentary behavior based on the situation, right? You're leading this conversation this evening, Jay. Right. Mm -hmm. But but you may hand off that behavior momentarily. You've just given it to me and said, go, go in whatever direction you want. And as a working group here, we you guys can follow me. You could listen. You could say, bring it back, reel it in um, and you can do it. It's it's the difficulty when it's dominating only by positional authority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then that, that's where we have such trouble when we try to transform any work group of scale. It right. feels like an Akbar moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what? You're saying you're abdicating power to me, but like how far and how far can I go? Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just as easy as, as any of the people that have experiment with, let's install this model, go. Um, it don't work so well. You brought up something interesting too. And uh, I always joke with people when the, the leadership says you're now empowered. If you have to tell me I'm empowered, I'm not empowered. I'm not empowered. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Jonathan. And if you can tell me that I am, you can also take it away when exactly. I don't <laughs> meet some unexpressed <laughs> expectation of yours. Like, oh, the mission changed and you forgot to tell me. Uh, no, no. Well, I'm sorry. We landed in the original place. And now you're going to blame me? Very true. Right, right. Very, very true. So building on top of this idea of a hierarchy, right? So there are hierarchies in our companies, there are hierarchies in our societies. Uh, they typically mirror each other, right? The structures of, of um, our worldview and how we function as people with each other, comparatively to how we function inside of organizations, there's not that, it's not too far removed. So Lalu introduces the idea of a hierarchy, and then he, he inadvertently introduces the concept of the triune brain. So I'm not going to go too far into this. Uh, we are going to talk about this during the Lucifer, princi uh, the Lucifer Principle recording, which I think is probably tomorrow night. Um, but there, uh, there's a, a scientist who came up with the idea that we have three brains inside of our head. We have the lizard brain, which is our fight or flight response. Yeah. We have our mammal brain sitting on top of that, which is um, reproduction, survival, um, all the things that we at mammals typically do. And then we have the human brain sitting on top of that. So there's three brains all nestled on top of each other. The one that is the most evolutionary is the lizard brain because it's been around the longest. And then we yeah. have the mammal brain on top of that, then the human brain. And he compares that inadvertently. He doesn't say the triune brain, but he compares it to historically we view humans as I know uh, we have three hearts is his concept. So I know in my heart, when I make that statement, I'm coming from a place of emotional honesty. I'm typically pointing at my chest. But we also have the heart of our gut, where when, how many times have you said, well, my gut tells me that this is a bad idea, right? That's yeah. a whole other heart. It's, a, it's a, another feeling center. And the third heart is the brain, where okay. I'm listening to you, John, and my brain tells me this. So the point Lulu makes, which also ties again to the Lucifer principle, it's funny how these things overlap, is we typically ignore two at the behest of the loudest one. So if my gut is yelling the loudest, I'm going to listen to my gut no matter what my heart or my brain tells me. If my brain is yelling the loudest, I'm going to ignore my heart and my gut. That's bad management decisions, right? And vice versa. So if you combine the idea of a hierarchy, right? And then you combine the idea of us feeling and sensing in three separate places, but only listening to the loudest one, is it any surprise that our organizations are built and function the way that they do? Short answer, no. Right, exactly, exactly. We've got, we've got 50,000 years of evolution um, that's been geared towards survival by collective belongership, belongingship, like, you know, tribal, um, village, uh, civil, and now corporate. But honestly, um, who, 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 Daniel Pink, the unmasking, um, and COVID, has revealed that, you know, that alliance to the corporate body, wow, wasn't that an illusion? Mm 
Mm -hmm. People are people are our most important asset well, until our stock price is at stake and suddenly 30% are let free. Yep. Yep. You're absolutely right. Um, so again, just before we hop into the actual levels, um, the colors that Andy was talking about prior, I, 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 I would ask our listeners as we go through this, think about um, the type of hierarchies that you experience, not only in your personal life, but in your professional life, and how that ties to sense-making and decision-making, where how often do people go off their gut versus the brain versus the heart and vice versa, and then how often does that paint you into a corner if you forsake two for the, uh, for the loudest one? So not to go too off topic, but there's something also interesting about hierarchy that's built in the corporate, which is it's not about just the title and where the influence structure is, but naturally when you are a quote leader executive in a company and there's a hierarchy that follows it, what's also part of that hierarchy is the compensation tied to that hierarchy level. Mm -hmm. Where there's actually also a social status that's a difference as well. Where, I mean, sometimes leaders honestly have a hard time empathizing with their teams because it's a social status distance of they don't know how to relate sometimes with their teams. So there's a little bit more and some variables there that are some interesting if you want to get into it. But yeah. Yeah, that's, that's huge, Jonathan. You know, just the compensation model alone, right, drives so much perverse behavior at the executive level. Yes. Right? Because their incentive and their potential monetary reward is so significantly greater than probably the aggregate of the people that they quote exponential yeah right yeah. yep um, there's that social factor um, they obviously did something to get where they are and so there's that status tied with that right those things yes. are huge in our brain right if you go deep inside those reward systems are huge and some people may not even recognize that that's they are using in the back of their mind, in the back of their lizard brain, that compensation piece, that yeah. incentivization piece to make decisions. Um, I was involved in a transformation uh, where our business head, so the head, the head of IT for this entire business unit that was involved in the transformation um, knew less about Agile than any three people combined in the, in the department. And we had a robust training course. We had a lot of great instructors on staff that were doing roving courses. I could not get this person into a class to save their lives. And it was because they didn't want to be in a course with people who were ranked lower than them in corporate stature because they didn't feel comfortable being able to show up and say, I don't know this. I have to ask a question. So I mean, talk about an incentive, right? In perception. Yeah. That would be like me outranking the two of you, even though, I mean, we're doing a, a, a we're, do, we're running a race car, right? We're running the Winston 500 and I know nothing about the internal combustion engine, but I, I and I know I need to know, but I don't want to be taught by, with you two in the room because no, you, no weakness. you know, you're just the pit crew, right? And Andy's the tire guy. Yeah. We can get into vulnerability in a second, but I, I, I want to unpack what you talked about. So this, this person that you invited in, what level of the hierarchy were they in? How many layers beneath? Let me put it that way. How many, and how many above? Beneath, there were, mm -hmm. beneath them, there were one, two, three, four, five, maybe six below them. So like a senior VP level. Uh, I, the best way to describe it in like banking terms, because I don't do banking, is like a senior vice president, executive vice president. Okay, so let me take my first contrary position or second, I've lost count. So what this person doesn't know a damn thing about Agile? Who cares? I will, I will agree with you, especially after the conversation we just had with Jeff Prey, where we talked about how teaching safe at that level is completely incongruous. Um, but I think that remark, Andy, when I brought it up, ties to some of the things we're going to unpack later with the idea of wholeness and bringing your whole self into an organization and being comfortable with the, you know what, Andy Clef, I am your boss's boss's boss. I don't know how to spell rhythm. I can't spell it correctly every time. So I need help. It's that, it. that wholeness piece. Yeah, and to right. empathize a little with that leader, not to justify it, but you're in a room with people where you're probably also the leader saying to them, hey, I've been directed to do an agile transformation. And even I don't know what that means. So I'm along the ride. And so his team's probably like, well, if you don't know, well, that doesn't build my confidence. So I could see a little bit of that, even though like we already said. Yeah. <laughs> Who <cares? Yeah. laughs> and, and the problem is, Nobody anywhere knows why they're doing Agile other than we got to do Agile. We got to go Agile. 
Yeah. Right? That's a whole nother show, right? <laughs> that, that and, is- and the fact that we're trying to teach the senior VP of, you know, bond widgets, um, what Agile is, is the wrong thing. It's like, mm-hmm. how do you communicate clear strategy? How do you, <laughs> the yeah. captain, then, uh, you know, the Titanic had a big problem, but he didn't, it wasn't because he didn't know how the engine run ran, right? <laughs> yeah, right. It, right. It was a failure of leadership in other ways. And in um, Marquet, Marquet's latest book, you know, he brings an example of an oil tanker that had the same leadership dysfunctions, right? The crew said, you know, I, I'm not so sure we could take that route. It looks like it's going right in the hurricane, right? And, mm-hmm. and he's like, yeah. I was born to ride right into the teeth of the hurricane, right? <laughs> 35, 39 sailors lost their lives because of, of this bravado or this failure to say, I don't know. I think that's more important. Um, I don't know. And the ability to say, however, this is where we need to go. And mm-hmm. here's why I trust you guys to figure out how the hell we're going to get there. And if that means... Jay is teaching you all agile and scrum and Kanban and safe. I support that, but don't, but don't lose the plot as, as Larman yep. says, yep. Yep. The, Larman, the, plot. The, the, the plot isn't for everybody top to bottom to understand agility values, principles, and practices. Right. Right. Any more that that you would teach that SVP how to use freaking Jira. Right. <laughs> That's a quick way to get unemployed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, I took us. I took us down a side rail. No, it was a good. It's a good conversation. So we've talked about hierarchies and the, and our three brains and how they work. Now let's get into the meat of this, right? So, uh, Lalu comes out early on and says that he bases work a lot on spiral dynamics, which is mm-hmm. um, if you've remembered our shows, Troy Lightfoot did a couple of shows. This is, I think John, you and I did one as well, where we talked about spiral dynamics were changed. This is um, Claire Graves, Do- uh, Chris Cohen, Don Edward Beck, human evolutionary consciousness. So. Mm-hmm. Frederick Lou bounces this up against organizational consciousness and says organizations also have certain steps on the spiral. Mm-hmm. And the organization typically resembles the prevailing cultural meme, not an internet meme, but a cultural meme, a spiral meme that represents its goals. Um, and I'll walk through them quickly and then we can talk about where I take umbrage. So he starts off at the bottom. His bottom of the, of the evolutionary tier is what he calls red. They're all named after colors. And this is constant exercise of power by the chief to keep foot soldiers in line. It's reactive, highly reactive with a short-term focus, and it thrives in chaos. Uh, the guiding metaphor is a wolf pack. Uh, examples are organized crime, street gangs, tribal militias. Uh, it, the breakthroughs that came from the, the advancements that came out of this way of thinking is things like division of labor and command authority, right? Yeah, control and, of territory, yes. right? Control yes. of scarce resources. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking meat widgets, although some will use them that way. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's fear-based. Yes. It taps into that, that little lizard brain that is so quick to respond to fear. And this, this jibes one-to-one with the red spiral color, which is uh, autocrat. Um, this is a dictatorship. This is Hitler. This is Pol Pot. This is Mao. This is Mussolini, Stalin. This is all your dictatorships, authoritarian rule, right? So at this point, we've still got one-to-one with spiral and, and Lulu. Okay. Now, now he starts going a little sideways. So the next step inside of spiral dynamics would be blue. And this is your conservative, um, conservative, uh, process-driven, formalized culture. Lalu calls it amber, and he describes it, its highly formal roles within a hierarchical pyramid. We just talked about this. Uh, top-down command and control. The future mm-hmm. is repetition of the past. So this is uh, scalable, repeatable processes. This is... So um, Taylorism. Yes, this is Taylorism, <laughs> right? Uh, the best examples he gives, uh, Catholic Church, military, uh, it says Catholic Church. It could be most Christian churches, uh, military, and most government organizations. So think about like school systems, police departments, whatever. It's yep. very much a, it was done this way in the past. I do it this way going forward and I will get the same results. It's that, um, like you said, it's Taylorism. It's looking at or, um, enterprises, not like an organism, but like a machine. So And, and that used to work for some of them. It probably mm-hmm. still does for some of them, although many of them are suffering. You know, the interesting thing is where an army used to fall within that and where it falls today based on the realities of, of quote, 
current day combat. Maybe we'll- right, right. Asymmetrical combat makes the whole idea of, of top-down control in the battlefield completely irrelevant, right? You need to yes. just go, do what you need to do to be successful. So okay. that's blue and amber. Got it. That's, that's blue and spiral and amber and blue. And then we come to the orange. So in spiral, this is capitalism. This is Jeff Bezos. And they do kind of match. For orange with Lalu, this is the guiding metaphor is the machine. This is the goal to beat the competition, achieve prof, achieve profitability and growth, management by objectives. Um, this is multinational corporations, investment banks, charter schools, the breakthroughs, the things that they created with innovation, accountability, and meritocracy, right? So this is capitalism at its purest bent. This is a company like, um, although I haven't worked there, a company like Amazon. Right or a company like J.P. Morgan Chase, most of your big financial institutions, where the driving goal is growth and profitability, right, wrong, or indifferent. What are the people elements in those orgs viewed as? Uh, they're viewed as, if I remember the book, they're viewed a lot like they are in Spiral, where they are important to the company's success, but they're still kind of treated like meat widgets. It's the next it. two levels where we get away from the meat widget and more into the um, heartbeat, not headcount type discussion. Got it. So moving past orange, we then come to green and this matches with spiral dynamics. So green and spiral is progressivism. This is um, inclusive cultures. This is your um, social justice movements. This is your, um, uh, again, progressive liberal politics. This is a focus on culture and empowerment to boost employee motivation. The stakeholders replace the shareholders as the primary purpose. So now you see where it starts to diverge from that whole capitalism. We got to make money. We got to make money and goes into idealism, idealistic businesses. And the examples he gives here are companies like Ben and Jerry's, Southwest, Starbucks, and Zappos. Got it. And, and the big thing here is empowerment, egalitarianism, and the stakeholder model. So this jives right back with Spiral Dynamics. At this point in Spiral Dynamics, this is where we come up on our coral people, right? Our teal people, our second tier thinking. Lou does the exact same thing here. He calls people teal. He calls organizations teal. Evolutionary teal is the term he used. And that means self-management replaces hi a hierarchical pyramid. Organizations are seen as living entities oriented towards realizing their potential. The guiding mm -hmm. metaphor is the living organism. So again, we've come away from the Tayloristic way of viewing things as a system and a machine and viewing things more organically as an organism, which is funny because organism and organization have the same Latin roots. The key breakthroughs are concepts or the three concepts that we're going to go through shortly, which, which Lalu swears are key to success in this type of organization. They are self-management, wholeness, and evolutionary purpose. So this is truly, um, this is second tier organizations way of operating where they're really going towards some sort of purpose and they're, they're including their people, but they're using their people to move past where they, they conceivably could see a boundary um, in a typical capitalist world. So in summary, my, this for me, honestly, I'll be honest, this was the hardest part for me to get through the book because I, I'm a big spiral guy. So I kept bouncing into that cognitive roadblock of, wait, is it, wait, wait Amber, is Amber beige or is Amber purple or is Amber blue? Mm -hmm. I, I, I had a little bit of struggle there. I actually had a post-it in the side of my book that mapped everything out to me. But for the most part, I mean, he, he bites a lot of the spiral dynamic stuff and it does make sense to apply that human evolutionary consciousness to an idea of consciousness inside of an organization. Yeah. We see it in other models as well that, that show up that are looking to help nurture a, a more evolved enlightened leadership capacity in organizations. Right. 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 And, 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 and they all talk about evolutionary growth and how all the latter models include the, the, the earlier models, right? Mm -hmm. But the earlier models cannot see the worldview of any of the more evolved models. Yes. That's where I always got in trouble, you know, talking like a green or teal person to an orange and amber VP of engineering and then mm -hmm. just them going like, I don't want to fight you, but I'm going to. Yeah, <laughs> right. You, you, can't, um, you can't see past your own cognitive boundaries, which is a theme that comes up in spiral dynamics. It comes up in integral theory. It comes in up in this again, right? If yeah. you don't know what you don't know, you don't know how to get there. You can't even believe it exists right. at some of these, at some of these um, lower stages of evolution. It's, 
is what we yeah, when read. You, when you look at the spiral dynamics of when they're talking about the behaviors or the instincts that are associated with the colors and how long those behaviors or attributes have existed compared to like the, you know, the yellows and te teals and it's staggering. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why it's just so ingrained to your point. Right. And, Right, it's back to that whole lizard brain, which has taken however many thousands of tens of thousands of years to uh, to yeah. evolve, versus the human brain, which is sitting on top of those. Um, which leads to the next point, which is something that came up in Spiral and it comes up in Lulu's book. I was very happy that he brought this up: the idea of nested growth, where you companies need to you're not what is old is not bad. The red is not bad to a blue person. And to a green person, both the orange and the red and the blue are not bad. They're just different. And they are vital to an organization's success. You need to grow hard vertically to pass through that spiral of, of, um, of evolution. But you can also expand horizontally as well. And that's a big thing that Lulu comes back to again and again and again. You don't necessarily need to move right up the, the colors, like the evolutionary ladder, mm -hmm. like they're just flat steps. You can take time to marinate and expand inside the level you're currently in before moving upwards. And I imagine you almost have to if you think about it at an individual layer, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's, nobody's going to make these quantum steps of leadership ability. You don't go from one orbital to the next just by a good coach coming in and juicing you full of energy for a week. Right. Right. Yeah, and right. I do kind of, I do kind of chuckle when you take a step back and you look at the actual spiral dynamics and you think about it and you're like, wow, I guess when I went through the interview process, it was a lot of yellow and teal and high ups. And then when you actually got into it, it was more, orange and blue and then when you mm -hmm. actually work with the teams you're you're straight up to red <laughs> <laughs> how do knives. i improve my glasses <laughs> right. right knives out right um uh, but it, it is a, it is an interesting way to look at it right the, the whole idea of nested growth um and, and then we, you, at this point in the book this is where i think lulu could have done with a better editor because he goes very very deep into the three facets we're going to talk about and mm -hmm. he has a lot of great examples from these companies companies like morningstar like andy talked about before we started recording the tomato processor patagonia yeah. right if you've ever read of eve's uh, let my people go surfing eve's Chinot, which i definitely butchered his french last name great brilliant guy there's Burtzorg, which is the um home nursing facility organization in Europe, which I thought was, what a fascinating story. That um, was beautiful. Really interesting. They have, the, John, they have a concept of a coach, but a coach is not de dedicated to any one team or for our terms, train or value stream. They are literally someone they bring in who is from, it was part of the company, but is from the outside to help coach them through the problems that they have, not solve them, but basically work as like a facilitator, mediator, moderator, to help them self-solve their own problems. It was mm. really, really fascinating. They, and Andy Clef, keep me honest, that organization almost functions, and I know this might be an inappropriate reference, almost like terrorist cells in the sense that they are all completely independent. They have their own self-management, their own ways of working. They're isolated, but they do serve a greater purpose. That's probably a really shitty example. Well, we don't have to worry about terrorism right now. It's yeah, just, you can it's just domestic. strike that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It is, in a sense, the self organizing units mm -hmm. that can tap into the greater good of the whole by sh cross sharing ideas, right through through various channels, but they are all completely autonomous, right, and, mm -hmm. and geographically, at least the last read geographically located and free to organize as they wish. And, um, you know, by every measure employee engagement, patient satisfaction, mm -hmm. as well as the bottom line. They have blown the doors off of every other yes. um, Scandinavian. I, I, are they, I don't, I don't know where they are. I forget, where they are. I want to say it's like the Netherlands. I want to say Netherlands, Denmark, yeah. And, and I know they, they, they tried a position in the US um, a few years ago. I don't know if it, if it took hold or if it was too alien, I think uh, it was a too universe. Alien. <laughs> You're like, you want to do what? Here? No. Yeah, right? You got to manage yourself. What, is that? what does that mean? Um, so there, and that is a perfect lead-in. So one of the three pillars of evolutionary teal organizations is the concept of self-management. This is one of the things that Lulu says, that if you're an organization that is trying to get to evolutionary teal, you need to practice this. And what he means by it, he actually breaks down the idea of self-management into some concepts that I'm sure the both of you will find very familiar. The first one he talks about is reverse delegation. 
So this is the whole idea. Who is John? Was it you just said, uh, if you tell me you're, I'm empowered, I'm not really empowered because that means yeah. you can take it away. Yep. There's a big chunk in the book, Bert's Org being a big example of lowering the decision-making floor. Dan Mezik talks about this all the time. Lower the decision-making floor to the people who are most impacted by the decisions. We so hear that over and over again. Yeah. Mar yeah. Mark Kay and his, his group, mm -hmm. right? Move, let the doer be the decider is his phrase because they know the most about it. We talked about the military briefly, mm -hmm. right? The doer is the one on the ground. Um, yeah, there, there's even an article that goes way back. I should dig it out. It, it, it was an, it was a, it's probably 20 years old and I don't know if it's still relevant. It was like, uh, who's got the monkey? Because it was one of those management things where anytime a problem came from the team to you, the boss, and you accepted it, you had the monkey on your back now. <laughs> you had to feed the monkey, clean up the shit after the monkey. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's the same concept that we keep playing with for the last, I don't know, 20 years. years. Yeah. Um, but so reverse de delegation. Let the, you know. And you mentioned uh, Marque, by the way, who uh, also said something that was very subtle when he brings it up, but it was really impactful. What he said, uh, the one decision I still leave with myself, though, is if it's taking the life of another individual. I left that with myself, so I didn't have to burden my team with that. And that was kind of important because if you relate that to the corporate world, there are decisions where the teams are not comfortable and the leader does have to step up and own something. Mm -hmm. So that's also servant leadership. Yes, Absolutely, 100%. Right. Knowing, knowing when you have to make that decision. Right. right? And not doing it. Being because judicious. somebody has to. Right? Yes, right. <laughs> being judicious in the application. The, there was another thing, another facet that Lulu brings up in regard to self-management, which I thought was very fascinating, which he calls the advice price, the advice process. So if I have a problem and I'm making a strategic decision, uh, to engage the advice process, I have to engage, uh, that's when I engage two different parties. So if I'm making a decision, say the three of us are in a company and I'm making, the, and we make, um, we make widgets, we make mm -hmm. gears and I'm making a decision which could uh, negatively impact um, or positively impact our bottom line. In order to make that decision, I have to consult with two people. Anybody's empowered to make a decision, but you have to consult when you make a decision with the first people are the experts. So if Andy Clef is my head machinist and I'm making a decision about us changing what widgets we sell. I have to go to him because he is the expert. He is the most technically knowledgeable about that thing. And the second part you have to meet within the advice process is the people who will be most impacted by this decision. So say, Jonathan, say you're actually on the line. You're the shop steward leading all the guys at the machines, punching the widgets, right? I need to talk to you too, because you're basically, you're going to have to deal with the monkey, right? That I have on my back. So I thought that was a really fascinating way. It's, it's empowerment without calling it empowerment, but it's empowerment by saying you're okay to make a decision, but you need to talk to the people who are going to have to eat that decision and the people who know the most about the decision you're making, which I thought was a brilliant way to look at it. Yeah, and that's when a lot of start, other variables start coming into play where you could even start questioning things like how effective is my group in just communicating in general? And can they conversate? Are they okay to engage people they don't know? And those types of questions where, because, you, you know, when you look at people who are natural business analysts that are usually like naturally have to scrape through the company to gather information and or project managers, and they just have a natural tendency to be a little more extroverted and be okay to reach out to people that get impacted. Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy skill, to be honest, mm -hmm. to acquire. Um, so it does, it takes time and how to, you know, politically correct it and talk with people because, you know, departments have different cultural things and how you talk with them as well. It's so talking to a shop floor person is very different than a finance person. So even corralling people together, it's interesting. I like this and, and I don't have any objection to it, shockingly. Um, and it's, it's a role, repeat. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just going to play the follower card for a minute. Um, it shows up again in other systems, right? Mm -hmm. So go back to management 3.0 and delegation poker, right? Mm -hmm. It's just clarity, but uh, delegating, you know, and rather than dictating. Mm -hmm. uh, it shows up in sociocracy also with experiment design and putting it out there for uh, consent, objections, or concerns. So... This, this makes a lot of sense. I'm curious, what you, how is this different than RACI? 
the, you know, the racy matrix approach. It's, I That's, would think it's, it's a, they share the same genetic makeup, I would think, right? Mm, I, right? I think so. I, think so. I, I, I don't think that's too far off. I know that may repulse some of the people on this call, but uh, on the on the listening to the in the listening audience, but I don't think they're that far off. But, so, and, but it, I know Andy, and I'll let you go, John. Um, yeah. I know Andy. We've had this discussion that typically you come across a lot of agile practitioners. John, I'm sure you've seen the same thing. Who want to throw the project management baby out with the bathwater? And there is some gems in that ginormous pinbop and the racy. We we may be leaning after this conversation leading into the acknowledgement that maybe that isn't one of the things that isn't the worst thing in the world to have, because it does add a little bit of clarity. Yeah. You were saying, John? Well, yeah. And I'll add to that real quick. Uh, every, there's definitely frameworks and tools that all three of us will say, no, I, that, I do not like it, but there will always be something in that framework or tool that we always go, well, this is actually not that bad, or we actually did like this. So mm-hmm. what, that always happens in a lot of stuff. And what I was going to say, just to play the devil's advocate since Sandy's dropping the ball here is, Let's say, oh, let's say there is a decision that needs to be made and we are the team and all three of us have full decision-making capabilities and can give intent, but all each of us thinks the other individual is going to do that. That's where some things start to fall apart, where if everybody has the ability to do it, then everybody else thinks somebody else is going to do it. Mm, mm, good point. Good and that's point. where I think the management starts having anxiety and then starts having a micromanagement, which happens a lot in agile transformations where they give them the reins and then the team feels uncomfortable, thinks somebody else is doing it. And then they step right back in and then we go back into the same mode. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Spot on. That's a, that's a good call. That's a very good call. And, and there is, and, and again, I did this as a, as a book report, right? I grossly oversummarized 400 plus pages. Um, there is, he does go into detail with that. Like the, he uses the example, there was a company in the book, I want to say they're APS or AAS. Mm. It was a company that does like machine parts, like cylinder machine parts. And it, the, he, he interviews the, the head of the company who actually had to come out and say, yes, there are times I had to make decisions because I was the only one best suited to do so because everybody was kind of stuck in a rut because while all very smart and intelligent and empowered, they couldn't get out of their own way. And that's good leadership. Like absolutely. recognizing when your team can't do it is good leadership. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, Let them try and yeah. then step in and say, okay, I'm going to help out here. And you know how he probably knew that he had to make a decision. He was close to his team, understood what they were doing and was part of their engagement. Mm-hmm. Like, and they wasn't in the distance. He wasn't fo- focusing on strategy on a five-year roadmap. You know, <laughs> he right, was in right. the know. <laughs> right. The rolling six year. Um, there's a running <laughs> joke to discord today. And the last thing in, in self-management, which we'll touch on real quickly is the idea of total responsibility. So not only are we reverse delegated, we're empowered. We seek advice of our peers and the people down the line who have to deal with our, uh, our, our solutions. There also is the idea of total responsibility. And he defined that as if we have a problem we're trying to solve, we have full liberty to solve that problem. However, we are bound to our previous commitments while we do so. So you own, you own the, the solving the problem, you own making the decision, but while you're solving the problem and making the decision, you still have to deliver all the shit you said you were gonna deliver, which I thought was a very interesting way to talk about. We know in our transformations, right? You have sometimes people wanna go whole hog, big bang transformation. And well, what happens to the work that's currently in flight that needs to, needs to be done you know, going back to zone management, the productivity and performance zone that keeps the lights on, right? That allows us to do that. Yeah, I thought that was a very interesting way to lay out that concept. I don't know, boys. I, you know, I, you had me for the first two and now this third one's kind of a heavy weight on my shoulders. I've got total responsibility. Uh, couldn't you just tell me what to do, please, boss? <laughs> I much prefer the older model. Right. And um, getting paid well for it. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm sarcastic here. Um, it's interesting when you put this into the framework of teams and teams of teams and the systems and then the coordination. If you don't have clear, I don't, know, I don't want to call them swim lanes, but you know, clear, clear boundaries, you can get into some mischief pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and you also does. need, you know, so, you know, you're reading the story of say Morningstar You know, they had some constraints, you know, they're in the food processing, they're making tomatoes. And if somebody says, you know, I, I need to build remote controlled drones, the, 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 you know, advice process might be what the hell for. Mm. 
And it might be, well, actually, we're going to fly over the tomato fields and monitor temperature and humidity and, and bugs. And, you know, we're going to have a better idea of the harvest coming in and how we got to blend. And you're like, oh, go for it. And, but alternately, if I want to make the military drones for surveillance, do I have total responsibility to do that? And, and yeah. that begins to be some of the constraints or some of the concerns, I guess, of the, the green or orange management that hopefully, um, I, does he talk, uh, I'm, I'm switching gears here, right? So we're back to that manager who we're expecting to transition to support all this stuff, the team that's there, hopefully receiving mm. it, man, there's a hell of a lot of tension. Yes, yes. Um, so skipping ahead, when, when Lalu talks about how do, we, how do we make this transformation to a teal organization, right? How do we get uh, ourselves along that step? One of the things he calls out, Andy, is um, you, need, uh, you need a leader, a CEO or a leader, that is fully bought in and at this evolutionary level, like they conceptualize and understand that teal piece, right? Which is what you were getting towards, right? What about the middle people? He also talks about how you need a board of directors that is okay with you making this change because it is a massive change, right? To lower the decision-making floor and self-empowerment and all that sort of stuff. But he also calls out, and it's almost as a toss away, throwaway line that I thought was really interesting. He talks about the middle management in a company trying to evolve this way. And the way he puts it, um, middle and senior managers, while not totally being bought in, have to commit to not sabotage the effort. <laughs> Sounds like every <clears throat> actual transformation right, we've right, been involved right, right, in. Right, right, right. Um, which is, uh, he throws it in as a throwaway line, but that would be something I'd be curious to see if I was a coach at a large enterprise or getting ready to go through a transformation and getting up and like when all the bog is sitting in front of you, the frozen middle and saying something like, look, I understand that half of you think I'm just full of shit and you don't think this is going to work and that's cool, but I'm just, I need your commitment to not torpedo me as I try and get this going. Right. Um, interesting. There's an interesting conversation to be had there. A uh, shout out to Kuzak. Cause you know, that line just reminds me of something he would do in front of, all those people, uh, but he wouldn't say it so politely. <laughs> Not even remotely close. Not even remotely. But that is, you mm -hmm. know, the, the clear agreement that you must have at so many different mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me bring up a scenario and see what you guys think of this, but we're talking about hierarchy. Why do people want high, like to go up hierarchy? Because usually it's career path, it's progression, it's compensation, it's all of those things. But hypothetically, there are some companies that do this, but very rarely, well, what motivates people is obviously I want to go up to get that compensation and higher career path. Well, if a company simply said, you're doing a great job and you're at the team level, forget hierarchy. We will give you what you need to feel comfortable, whether that's comp or influence, but just stay at the team level. What if we actually had people that got paid just like a senior VP or executive that almost went to a C level and just kept them at the team level? Maybe the teams would feel more comfortable driving decisions and having intent if yeah. we people didn't worry about hierarchy so much. That would be an interesting ex experiment. And I would be curious to see what the long-term impacts of that would be. Cause then you have people who are truly comfortable. Like think about how we treat developers, right? Software engineers. Yeah. Um, Andy Clef is a great Java developer and he's great at what he does. And he Fire. works his way up to a senior engineer. Then what we say, we say, Andy, you know what? You're so good at writing code and, and fixing things and creating good solutions. We're going to make you manage people. Because exactly. that's your next step. Right. And Andy has an entire um, plethora of experience in writing code and solving code. And now he's got to lead and solve people. And then you get engineers that are miserable. They, they, they are uh, unhappy because that's not what I want to do. But I need to learn how to do this because I want to make more money. To your point, Jonathan. Right. And then it, it's a self-defeating circle. Yeah, and, they're, and, and they're thrown in, they're unsupported by the HR systems, the accounting systems, et cetera. So yes, and it's all broken yep. Yep. and, and yep. it will not work. And like but, I said, there are some companies that are pushing, like a lot of the major tech companies, the FANG ones, you know, I mean, you hear stories about developers that get offers that are ridiculous and they're just part of the team. So it exists, mm -hmm. but I mean, those are very far in between. Um, so yeah, it's just something that's very interesting and psychological in the hierarchy space. So it would be it would be fascinating if somebody has a white paper out there. I'm going to actually do some googling to see if there's a study of that because I guarantee you they've gotten great results. Guarantee you they've gotten great results. 
Um, so let, let's touch on the other touchstones of, yeah. of evolutionary tail thinking. So the next one to me is um, almost foreign because it's natural. It's the idea of wholeness, um, bringing your whole self to work. It improves relationship. It leads to trust. Um, wholeness got away from us in the workplace with the rise of Taylorism because people who are feel they're interchangeable, they're easier to control. They truly become meat widgets. Whereas if you bring your whole self to work, you express individuality, but you also express um, motivation and uh, navigation towards a common goal. Um, you know, the running joke, I've met Andy Clef in real life, Jonathan, I haven't met you yet. It's inevitable. Um, the exact same way I am on these podcasts is the way I am with my wife, is the way I am I'm at the bar, is the way I am at work. So to me, this is kind of amusing because I just, I don't know how to put on the fake face. I mean, it's walking like a duck. It's a quacking like a duck, Mr. Executive. I know you can call it a flamingo, but I'm going to tell you it's a fucking duck. But this is truly one of those things that organizations at the person level and then at the team and at the, at the all the way up level, they need to embrace. It's the idea of a safe environment. It's the idea of openness. It's the idea of transparency. It's the idea of just... Um, what you see is what you get. I'm not motivating myself under one thing, but telling you it's another. So I'll admit to something I'm not proud to admit, but dear, the podcast listeners might appreciate this. Uh, I am my authentic self and I get drive re- or jive really well with technology people. So when I'm just my authentic self, I get along with other technology enthusiasts and others. But when I'm in a room with finance, marketing, supply chain, and heavy leaders, that authentic self sometimes is not the right social construct to be successful. So I have to put on a different demeanor and mm-hmm. culture presence to get them to be part of what I'm trying to do. And I'm not proud of that, but I know that that's how I progress my career, my leadership stance. And un- unfortunately, I don't like doing that. Like not being my authentic self is weird in meetings. So, right, but, <laughs> but like you said, the way that the evolutionary organization that you're part of is, right? Where they are in the right. evolutionary ladder, you need to take on the facet of someone who you may be teal, but you need to act like someone who's orange because that's the only way your that's message way. resonates. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so, Jay, you tossed a softball up there. I'm not going to let it hit the ground. It was just too tempting and juicy. Oh, no. You said you, you show up like this to your marriage, to your job, to the bar, to the friends, and yet you're still working and getting paid. You're still, Kim still lets you in at night, and we still <laughs> love going drinking out with you. So, yeah, I gotta be, I don't know. Either, but it could be why I, everything I, every relationship I'm involved in goes into absolute flaming disaster eventually. But, um, uh, but there Fire is something, <laughs> there is something to be said about. You know, um, there was, I think it was a book by Michael Hammond, Evolve Agility, where he talked about, you know, the the holding environment for for realizing growth and development. And he he quoted the separate book that said, everybody has two jobs at their work. They have two jobs. They have doing the job that they were hired for, delivering whatever they were supposed to be delivering and covering up their mistakes. And he said that, you know, if you create the environment where that second job becomes unnecessary, that first job becomes way more powerful because if you're never, if you're never having to switch gears about how do I cover my own ass, you'll get much better results. And that goes back to that senior VP at the bank, right? Mm -hmm. Who, who couldn't show what he doesn't want to do. Uh, Jonathan, you were talking about bringing your whole self to work. And I, and I suspect the bit I know about you, you do bring it, even though you turn, you put on a, I don't even want to call it a mask, but it's a it's a a costume, if you will, right? That's appropriate. But in neither case would you withhold failure with learning, right? So that, I think that that's the wholeness piece that's coming here. Is like you bring your whole self, your feelings, your vulnerability, your fears, but you're still fucking brave. And we'll say what needs to be said in the team room. You might be able to just come out with it and say, guys, I, I think that's the worst effing idea ever. But when you're in a different situation where there's power dynamics, you might be, you know, have we considered every aspect of this? That's fair. What yeah. could possibly go wrong? All right. You guys aren't getting this. Um, can we do a pre-mortem on this before we proceed? I don't know what you're talking about, John. And I'm glad you said it that way, because that goes back to what I was saying on, if we really want teams empowered with intent to make decisions, can everyone really adjust themselves that way as well? 
And I think then that it could be mm. very effective across mm -hmm. the board across, you know, collaborating and brilling in the right people to do the job and get it done. If so you, if you aren't f afraid about that second job that yes. Jay talked about of mm. covering up your inadequacies, because um, in so much of the world, that vulnerability is viewed as weakness rather than strength. Yep. And that's mm -hmm. what really gets us in trouble and keeps us from creating these, these possibilities in organizations and in teams. Yep. Yeah, we have some tough conversations with our leadership where I say, uh, when we fail, how are we going to handle it? And somebody corrected me and said, you mean if? And I went, no, I said it correctly the first time. <laughs> when we fail, how are we going to handle it? <laughs> Fail fast. Uh, you know, there's stats that come out of all the, the big ones. Amazon says, you know, I don't know how many experiments they do per day, per second, but 66, maybe more percent are failures. And they're proud of that number because they fail quickly in minutes, in 15 minute chunks of beta tests. And they're like, nope, not there. Try this. Ooh, that looks promising. So yep. in this complex world that we did, we're, it's not Henry Ford's factory right? It is not a defined process. We're making this shit up as we go along. And yeah. so the, the faster your cycle time to learning, which half the time, if you're lucky, is failure because you can learn a lot. If it yeah. succeeds, you might like, yeah, what did I forget? My, you know, where's my bias in this experiment? That was too easy. When you just said that, all I could think of was that means that 66% of the work that they delivered resulted in learning. Right, because it's not a failure. It's a it's something they learned. You know, exactly. half the half the stuff that we tried didn't work. But what did we get out of it? Oh well, I tried to go that way. Maybe this way is the better way to do it. So what if Jonathan, if you're in that environment and you know you're speaking to someone who's failure adverse, mm -hmm. it's about language, right? Not, not when this experiment fails. So when we when we right. confirm this hypothesis or refute this hypothesis. What, what are you talking about? Well, well it's an experiment. I, I don't know how it's gonna come out. I have an idea, but the, the, the more quickly I can test it, I don't wanna take six months to test this and spend $6 million to find out no one's gonna use it. I wanna spend six days and six grand. Yep. And, and it, mm -hmm. you can frame it in a way that doesn't threaten the, the amygdala of that person who thinks, oh fuck, there goes my bonus. Yep. I'm not going to hit that KPI, that MBO, blah, 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 blah. I love what you're saying because I live by that phrase of uh, what's the author of the seven habits of an effective leader where understand before being understood is one of them. And you have to understand their language, where they're coming from, their situation. To your point, Andy, everything you're saying right now where it's like, okay, so they're not agile savvy. They don't know this context. They've never done a product approach, but I think I can twist my words in a way that they could understand. It's the same message that they're going to resonate anyhow. Yep. And so make sure you understand them and then you can be understood kind of thing. The, uh, that, that ties to a, a buddy of mine, Scott, um, Scott Wagner said he, he told, he sent me some article which talks about the idea of coaching and where sometimes coaches fall apart is they get so hung up with wanting someone to, it's basically what you said, John, put in a different way. They get so hung up on wanting the client to agree with them that they don't realize that the client doesn't even understand what they're saying. <laughs> so if you concentrate on getting people to understand, then if they don't agree, you can have them. That's a learning moment. Like, Oh, well, what, what blinders are you looking through that you see things? What rose colored glasses in a different way yeah. leads to a better solution. It Guilty. Really does. Guilty yeah. as charged Done it <laughs> so many times. It's embarrassing. Yeah, but it's a human thing. We, we, we fall back on it all the time. So um, I'm going to hop right through this last pillar. The last pillar is uh, what I think is the most interesting one, but it's also the most like touchy-feely, you know, kumbaya -ish. the idea of evolutionary purpose. So an organization that lives for its purpose has no competition. Uh, it's an organization treating itself as a living system, not an optimizable machine. Hmm. Um, the example he used in the book, which I thought was pretty funny because it created me a great mental picture, is imagine if you rode a bicycle like we attempt to manage our companies or manage our projects. I'm going this way. I'm holding my hands rigidly at this at arm's length. I've got the handlebars and I'm pedaling, not making any account for the squirrel that runs on the road, the kid that comes and kicks you over, the basketball that hits you in the face. You know, you have to pedal harder. You're going uphill, you're going downhill. So he makes the remark of imagine setting a direction 
and just going and not ever taking the time to step back and analyze and say, does that direction make sense? So that's what he talks about with evolutionary purpose. Your purpose should be consistent, should be oriented around a North star, but should consistently involve growth is not a target. He talks about um, uh, growth, you know, growth for growth's sake is the same ideology as cancer, right? You don't just want to grow for the sake of growing. And then he, in the analogy he makes with air profits, he compares profits to air. He says, while we need air to breathe, we don't live to breathe. We need air to live, but we don't live to breathe. Same thing with profits. You need profits to survive, but you don't live, you don't live to make profit, right? So the companies that are only worried about shareholder value in the bottom line, John Kay's oblique, when he talks about this all the time, you're going to run, you're going to only make short-term decisions because you're only cared about profitability. You're going to steer the plane right into the fucking ground. Yeah. And, and we're littered with those all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. go back to Enron, go back to Wells Fargo, go back to VW and lately Boeing. Yep. But, yep. but here's the thing, you know, it'd be fun to talk to Lou about today where the whole world is completely different. Yeah. It is dramatically different. Maybe that's my confirmation bias, but I, with what is going on both um, health-wise, um, the impact on the economy, and now um, in the U.S., the, the unrest. How, you know, the red and the amber and the orange mindsets are just pulling back. They must mm-hmm. be regressing instead of moving forward and saying, yep, there's a better way we can... We can deal with this. I suspect the near-term reaction is a is a de-evolution of thought, um, society, and possibly uh, organizations for survival. I, I think you're right. I think we're going to see a. <clears throat> if we're speculating, I think we're going to see a retrenching. Um, we're going to see companies doubling down on what they know works because they think that that's going to see them through the future. Although I argue that's not the case. Um, <laughs> One of, the next, one of the next books we're going to eventually have a book report on is Strauss and Howe's The Fourth Turning, which talks about um, time not being linear nor chaotic. It's cyclical. And to your point, Andy, they have been predicting that we were coming along a fourth turning since the last um, 10, 15 years. And it looks like right now what we're living through is actually that fourth turning. Um, so I'm not gonna. I just want to wet everybody's whistle. It's gonna be a really fascinating conversation to talk about. Um, but we're we gonna t- talk about string theory and quantum mechanics, and we gotta, you know, we gotta ring up multi-dimensional Jeff universe. Yeah, we'll ring up Jeff Prey. We'll get him on again. He helps me derail so many meetings with that stuff. Um, so we talked about self-management, wholeness, and evolutionary purpose. These are the three corners, the three pillars that are needed to create an evolutionary teal organization. So then we get to the last half of the book, which I also thought was the most fascinating part. It's where most of my notes were, where he talks about how do I do this inside of a company? So start, he, then he talks about the obvious part that startups are easier than a giant enterprise org mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because they're fresh. He said, but if you've got an enterprise org, we talked about it already. You need to have a leader that's evolved to this point that's okay with it. You need to have a board of directors that's evolved to the point that they're okay with you taking the leap of faith. Um, and then he talks about he calls back the spiral dynamics where you can't outkick your coverage. You can't have a company that's ready to hit this evolutionary teal in the aggregate, but then you have leadership that isn't ready. That's when things get ugly and it, the rubber band snaps backwards. So if you've got those two things, which is a lot easier said than done, then he starts walking through, okay, so what are the steps? The first yeah. step he talks about is start with defining your organization's assumptions and your organization's values. What are the things that you all operate on as an assumption? Which is, um, I just finished a book on appreciative inquiry. Assumptions are organizational shorthand. They mm-hmm. offload cognitive decision-making for your people because they know that, oh, okay, well, this is the way we've always done things. That's an assumption I can hold as truth and move on. What it, the other thing about assumptions is they're notoriously hard to change because they're shared inside the culture, almost like this weird pervasive, um, um, almost like a cancer, right? Or a virus. It's all over the place. So he, Lulu prescribes, start with this, defining your values and defining your assumptions. What are the things that you think are important? What are the things that define who you are as an evolutionary organism? So start out with that first. And then he starts talking. He treats those three pillars as practices. And for each one, you could acknowledge some type of, some sorts of practices. Um, there's a whole laundry list of them. I picked out the ones I thought were um, most impressive to get yourself there. So along with self-management, 
So obviously the advice process plays into self-management. You're going to want to introduce that. He talks a lot about conflict resolution. So to your point, John, about when you have multiple teams that are all empowered, how do they make that decision? How do they, how do they um, cut the Gordian knot? There's a whole giant chunk in here around conflict res- resolution and how to effectively do that without, without a hierarchy where, okay, well, I go to your boss. And then he goes Mm -hmm. to his boss, then he goes to his Mm -hmm. boss. And then somebody completely removed from the problem makes a decision that screws everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's, along with the um, advice process, there's that conflict resolution mechanism. And then with this is a very aspirational and kind of kumbaya, but I think it makes sense. The idea of peer-based evaluation and salary. So you talk, Jonathan, about where, what if I am a, I am a team lead and that's what I'm best at. And you're going to continuously increase my um, incentivization and my, my compensation to keep me where I'm best at so I can make the best results. What if those type of decisions were done at the peer level? So collectively, you all get together and sit around and say, okay, well, Andy Clef really busted his ass this year. So let's give him a giant chunk. Um, and I think, Andy, this is part of Management 3.0, isn't it as well? The whole it, idea it of, is. of of divvying up the incentive, like where the group decides that, okay, well, this person really pulled the lion's share. They yeah. should get the lion's and, share. And it, and it requires radical transparency and salary and open books and all that stuff. And so I'm going to throw the red flag and say it'll never effing work because it's going to turn into reality TV survival. All you need is one bad actor. Mm-hmm. To, to to go, hey, Jay, your review's coming up. Mine's coming up. Let's, uh, let's... Yep. John pissed me off last week at that code mm-hmm. review, and he embarrassed me. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just seeing what's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. I, I, I wish I had some better opinion and some more data that showed there's a greater percentage of population moving uh, in these directions than the other ones. But yes, that, that is something that shows up all over the place, right? Mm-hmm. Let the team decide, give them some, some bucket or the organization has a bucket and trust that they will divvy up things in a fair way and there's a path to, to resolve it if there's conflict that can't be resolved at that, that atomic level, and Andy, whatever it is. I, I 100% agree with you because I think most of the organizations we also are very aware of that have bonus structures that already flow that way, where you get a bucket of money for your department and now your bonus has to flow through that department with this money for the bonus, not even salaries, it's not even working. Like there's recency mm-hmm. bias, there's all these things factor yep. and that's just the bonus. Right, yep. so, and, so yeah. it's yeah, a well, huge overhaul of HR. Yes. And yes. accounting. You know, all these systems that still put in the structure that keeps us in some of this old, yes. older thinking patterns, right? And, and while some, Andy, would say that you're being cynical, I think you're actually being right because at the end of the day, people are people. We are humans and this is what we do. And we're going to, and here I go, seating the, seating the audience. We're going to talk about this in the Lucifer Principle. It's one of the yep. things that he brings up as one of the primary reasons we act as humans the way we do um, ties very lightly to Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene, right? Where at the end of the day, we're trying to ensure continued, um, it's gonna be a great podcast. C- continued evolution, right? We're going to blow some people's minds. Um, so, okay. So that's self-management with wholeness. These are things that any agile practitioner should be comfortable with, or at least familiar with the idea of creating safe spaces and establishing ground rules, Mm -hmm. Um, changing the office space to meet the culture. Although, like you said, Andy, let's get Lalu on the call and say, you know, 85% of our people are distributed now. Another chunk of that are never going back to an office again. How does that change the whole paradigm? Um, Onboarding processes, you know, how do we mm-hmm. onboard people? Meeting practices, like all those mm-hmm. things around wholeness, right? Like <laughs> there have been some meetings where I've showed up and been Jay and it has not gone well. And my <laughs> boss is like, eject, goose, eject, watch the canopy, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's not going well. But, but there are other times where it does. So that idea of, you know, s- setting that um, behavioral more, more um, going in saying, this is how we're all going to act in these meetings. It's, it's probably part and parcel. And the last one is evolutionary purpose. So when you're trying to do evolutionary purpose, what are the two things you can impact quickest? The first thing is recruitment, right? So how do you recruit people? He does a lot about HR, recruiting, hiring. Um, how do you manage someone out? Does that really happen? Uh, again, some of it's very, you know, aspirational kumbaya stuff, but it does hold, it does hold water. 
And then there's the idea, which I think every single one, every single listener could do starting tomorrow. It's the idea of the empty chair meeting practice. So when you have a meeting, Mm -hmm. there is an empty chair in the room. That empty chair represents the company as a whole, the organization as a whole. And And at any time, someone can get up and sit in the chair and say, okay, you know, we're having a meeting. And then Jonathan gets up and sits in the chair and says, I right now am representing the Agile Uprising. And I don't think that this decision we're making makes sense as far as our purpose and as far as what our aspirational goals are. So it creates that ability for someone to personify the company in the aggregate and then make a statement based upon what they're seeing and how that decision relates to the assumptions and values and purpose that they're trying to get to, which I think is really, really powerful. Right. Just knowing that chair is there and anybody can inhabit it at any time. Uh, You can get up, sit right down and say, okay, here's what I'm thinking based upon the conversation in the room. I think that's brilliant. It it creates a safe space inside of a meeting. Yeah. I like it. So let's all try that tomorrow and what happens when our bosses freak out. Um, And then the, the last thing Lalu covers off is how do I initiate this change, which I thought was really fascinating. So he comes up with three ideas to try and roll this out in your organization. The first one is creative chaos, which is the equivalent of saying, what's this button do? Or what happens when we do this? So you just try and go all in overnight. And his call out here is it does require a lot of organizational trust, a lot of everyone being the wholeness, right? That safe space idea. You need to trust in your uh, organization's ability to self-organize. And then you have to trust that they will inherently own their work, that whole responsibility process, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I am am empowered to make decisions as long as I meet my commitments. It's kind of, I'd like to see it happen in a large scale organization. I can imagine like Vikings and shit, like at some of the banks I've worked at, right? Like flaming torches and and, uh, halberds and, uh, you know, the giant, you know, catapults throwing, you know flaming yak dung over the walls and stuff. Um, So I don't know how realistic it is, but it is an idea. The other idea he comes up with is the idea of the bottom-up redesign, which is, uh, I'm going to quote it verbatim, collaborative opt-in initiative for everyone to jointly decide their new way of working. And when I read that, the first thing I heard was open space, right? Opt-in, totally optional. You dedicate your time. You volunteer to be part of this because you have an interest It does. It it makes sense. And he does call out appreciative inquiry here as well. We're going to do a whole nother show on that uh, coming up soon. Um, But the thing with the bottom up redesign, he calls out, like I said earlier, you need to commit to, you're not going to sabotage my shit while I'm trying to do this. I promise I'm not going to do it (laughs) until I get a better offer from Jonathan. You know, (laughs) I can just see middle managers going, Lord of the fucking flies, right? (laughs) We're going to put you in this skunk works because we're going to do this experiment and you're just going to go and we're going to come back and there's going to be nothing but carnage. Yep. Yep. And uh, I don't understand how that idea goes anyway, but poorly. Um, it's pro- probably like an in- it would be an interesting sitcom to watch it happen in real life, like reality TV. Um, and the last thing that he says with the approach to initiating this, which I know is a terrible idea, <laughs> is the idea of a using a pre-existing template for change and you have a switch day where we go home on Friday, we come in on Monday. We are now <laughs> thing. But here's where, here's where, okay, those first two things sound a little crazy, but here's where he loses me. He consistently in the book, and again, this is an older book, bangs the holacracy drum, right? We all know that holacracy does not work. Zappos is the biggest company to try it. And it was a, it was if the Titanic and the Hindenburg had a, baby baby it was a disaster right it and is top down you can't treat imposed people. Yes. You that can't treat the executive like, team um, decides yep. and says tomorrow we're doing that well it wasn't tomorrow you know there was a transition and there was training but yeah that, that, that mm. besides the whole idea of holacracy i just don't think it works in the sense that you're treating people it's it, it, anderson i think chris anderson's the guy's name called it the human operating system of organizations you're treating people like like code Right. Yeah, here we go. Any quantum mechanics. Are you, you know, I'm yeah. Schrodinger's employee. Am I productive or am I not productive? I don't know. Open my, <laughs> open my email and find out. Right. Um, yeah. That whole idea of treating people like here we are talking about people are not meat widgets and they're not fungible. And then you're introducing holacracy, which treats them like they're fungible meat widgets. It's like. Yeah. yeah and if you sh- just install this operating system, safer, <laughs> 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 everything will work smoothly. Right. 
Right. And, and in exactly. fact, you, you said earlier, it is more like an organism or, or maybe at scale, it's more like a city, but it, it's not a machine. It's yes. not an operating system. And I, and I agree with you. That's where something that is um, like holacracy, where it's just, you know, we're going to replace the, the previous hierarchy with this new operating system. That's how you can work. And there's all these rules and regulations yeah. circles, I think. Um, the idea of an evolved postmodern organization where people can show up with their whole selves and have this accountability is a wonderful idea. I don't know that holacracy is the way to get there. You know, it's yeah. interesting too. If you look at countries that actually do have like a very tight culture that are usually smaller, like United States is huge, but there are countries in Europe and stuff that have very tight knit cultures and they're very, very tradition, a lot of traditions that are similar. What I'm getting at here is, is, if you actually went with a holacracy model where everybody was very fungible, you would probably start to see a lot of that to happen. A lot of similar traditions and cultures mm -hmm. and norms where like you would think holacracy would actually very much damage your diversification and your innovation in the company as well. Cause you don't have people really pushing the envelope cause they're all the same almost. Yep. Yep. The, um, and you just brought up an interesting point, John, if we really wanted to get drunk and go down the rabbit hole, right? <laughs> that idea of, um, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, homogeneous cultures, right? Yes. Where, yeah. why does why does socialism work so well in the Nordic countries? Well, it works so well in Norway because ninety eight point something percent of the population is Norwegian, right? Exactly. So if you have the same cultural context, the same social. Oh, I thought that was I thought one of my dogs dropped something. It's thunder. Um, the same social contract it makes it that much easier. So, I mean, and I know we've, we've gone on for this one really long. I loved you guys playing on the bad, good cop, bad cop, bad cop, worst cop. Yeah. All in all, uh, for the readers, I would suggest check the book out. He has a lot of videos on YouTube. I mean, I think there's a lot of really good ideas in here. The open yeah. chair and the appreciative inquiry and, and, and the, the, the responsibility lowering. I think there's some great ideas there, but I, I can see where this could be construed as uh, this is unrealistic and not going to happen. Because it's like you said, Angie. This, Andy, this is a evolutionary step change across an entire enterprise, and the th companies that the three of us have typically worked at are so large in scale mm -hmm. that I don't know how you could. I didn't know how you could do that, and that was the other dirty secret of the book. None of his organizations are nearly as big as some of the stuff that we coach at or we try to transform. And this Not might even be close. Cool. This might be a little cynical to say, but I would say read the book only because even if you know that what he's saying is unachievable and unrealistic, it's good information to bring back to your companies and people that you help coach, that there are experts that say this is the path that we think is the best to go down. And that's what you're looking at. So like, what do you really want to do? Let's manage expectations of experts are saying this is the path and mm -hmm. everybody's saying, well, that's unrealistic. Well, these are experts in the field. So what do you want to do here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Final thoughts, Andy Clef? None, zero. I got zero left. <laughs> uh, John, I, you just basically <laughs> did yours. Anything else? No, this is awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, so once again, uh, thank. I want to thank uh, Andy and Jonathan to take time out of their bu a busy quarantine. Um, we're sheltering in place, riot lockdown to spend time with me. And I want, on behalf of the three of us, I want to thank all of you listeners for listening. We have a Discord, which is quite vibrant and a lot of conversation going on. Uh, that's how I learned that Jonathan drives an orange car. Um, we have a Discord site. We have blogs. We have other episodes of the podcast are available. If you feel so inclined, we have a Patreon if you want to chip in. Um, chip in once a month and maybe you get a sticker package surprise in the mail with a lot of the fun one-liners we generate. Uh, I want to, again, if you, this is, if you, this is your first time listening and you like our show, you can subscribe, please. If you have a chance, if you're sitting there with your phone, again, I want to thank you, John, on behalf of Andy, John, and myself, I want to thank all the listeners, and this is Everyone Closing Podcast, signing out. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. <laughs>